الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اشتبا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد كمثل غيث أعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور سابقوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها كعرض السماء والأرض أعدت للذين آمنوا بالله ورسله ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم صدق الله العظيم من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم started inviting people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find that there was a group of people who came right to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looking for him as if they were waiting for that message for a long time. Looking at the history, we find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the only prophet that people believed in him before he was even born. And not only people, we find an ayah in Quran al kareem where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ Allah took a promise from all the prophets that once I give you the book and the knowledge of my deen and if during your lifetime this prophet would come you have to believe in him and you have to follow him. So a covenant was made with all the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam that if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to come at your time then you would start following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you would believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And accordingly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it such that there were people who were waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he even started inviting people to Islam, in fact before even he received the revelation. As soon as those people heard about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
they quickly grabbed the opportunity and came to Makkah Mukarramah to learn more about this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find most of them embraced Islam right there. One of those people was from a clan called Bani Ghifar. And his name was Jundub bin Junada. Jundub bin Junada says that the occupation of our tribe was robbery. He says we used to survive on that. We had no other way and other means of income. We had no way of doing any trade, any business. To the extent, in their town, they didn't even have stores. The mean of their life <coughs> and the mean of their income was robbery. And Jindab says, I was one of those people. But with this, he says, it was in my mind, idol worshipping is wrong. And therefore, I gave up idol worshipping and I knew that there is only one God. There can be more than one God. And here I may pause for a minute to remind of something very important. And that is the need for, of Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam. Without Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam, people may realize that there is no God but Allah, but, but one. But they won't know how to please him in spite of giving up all of the idol worshipping still, his occupation did not change. Because he doesn't know that God doesn't like this. He won't allow me to do this. What is good and what is bad, that's something that we can learn it only through Anbiya alayhi salatu لقد ارسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وانزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان we sent our prophets with clear proofs and we gave them books for you people and we gave them al-mizan which means the scale the values that we can through which we determine what is good and what is bad those come from anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam a person looks and a woman on the street, she doesn't have hijab, she doesn't have proper Islamic clothing. He likes that woman. That's his value that he has set in his mind that these things look good. Another person looks at that, he says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam came with that al-mizan, with that scale. With those values to set in our mind, and those will determine then what is good and what is bad. So Abu Zar radiallahu this Jindab bin Junada radiallahu anhu says that I gave up idol worshipping, and in my own way I started thinking of ways how can I please God, how can I obey and worship God. And he says, finally, one day we heard that there is a person in Makkah who claims to be a prophet. So he sent his brother to Makkah, Mukarramah, to go and get him some information about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went to Makkah. And when he went back to his brother, all he told him was that I know this man asks people to do good and prevents them from doing evils. But it's too dangerous to go and talk to him at this time because it's one of the worst crime in that country, in that part of the land at this time, to associate with that person or to talk to this man. But of course, this did not scare Jindab away. And he decided to go to Makkah himself. He said, when I went to Makkah Mukarramah, I saw the situation that it was extremely dangerous to talk to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or even to ask about him. I, I didn't even know who this person was. 
He says, I spent three days by the Kaaba just trying to figure out who this man would be. But I was afraid to ask anyone. For three days, he says, I, all I had to eat or drink was the water of Zamzam. And this reminds us of a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he said, water of Zamzam is not only a drink, it's a food also. If a person would just drink the water of Zamzam, would not have to eat anything else with it. That would suffice. Unlike any other water in the world. He says, after the third day, Ali radiallahu anhu saw me there, and he said, I think that you came here for some of your work, but you did not finish it yet. I see you sitting here all the time. So if you want, you can spend the night with me. I accepted his invitation and went to spend the night with him. After Fajr, in the morning, so I went back to the Kaaba and I spent the whole day there, still waiting to find out who this person is. Next day he saw me, next night he saw me sitting at the same place. He said, I think still you couldn't finish your work. I said, no. Okay, if you want, you can spend another night with me. And he took him home. But this time, as they were having dinner together, he asked him why he was there in Mecca and who he was looking for. So he said, if you would keep it secret, I would tell you that. He promised him to keep it secret. He said, there is a person in Mecca who claims to be a prophet. I'd like to go and talk to this man. Find out exactly what he's inviting people to. And if he's really a true messenger of Allah. He says, okay. I'll take you to him tomorrow. But you know that it's extremely dangerous. It can even cost you your life if they'll find out that you are talking to this man. He said, I don't mind. I have to talk to him. I've been waiting for it for a long time and I have to find the truth now. I can't wait for it for any longer. Ali radiallahu anhu said to him, In the morning, follow me. If I see a situation that might be dangerous for you, I'd pretend that I'm fixing my shoes and you just keep on walking past me. Don't wait for me. So that they won't know that you are with me and you are following me because they know I follow this man, I follow Prophet ﷺ. And this is how this jindab went to Rasulullah ﷺ, who is known as Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu. His real name is Jindam bin Janada, and he's known as Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu, one of the greatest Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. Unfortunately, most of us are not familiar with these, even the great Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. There are about 124,000, although we don't have to know all of them in detail, but at least we have to know the greatest of the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. Because if we won't know these people, who else we would know and who we are going to follow in our lives for our deen? These are the only and these are the best examples for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires us in Quran, إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنُوا النَّاسِ Your iman, your faith has to be like the iman and the faith of these Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in. Abu Zarr radiallahu anhu says, when I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I said to him, assalamu alaykum. And he was the first person to use this assalam in Islam. I asked him, how many people have believed in you? He said, four people. So I told him that I would be the fifth person. And he took his shahada. Now he says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, I would like to go and announce it by the Kaaba that I became Muslim. For almost five days he's hiding. He just took the shahada right now, a few minutes back. The level of Iman went so high. Being in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for those few minutes. Change the situation. 
so far and so tremendously that now a person who's hiding for five days in few minutes, he changed all of his plans and he says, I would like to go and announce it over there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, do you know that this may cause you life? Ya Rasulullah, whatever it will cost. Whatever it will cost, I like to do it. Abu Zar radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say anything, he just remained quiet. And that simply means, he is not asking me to go, but as he sees the level of this person's iman, he says, sure, I want to stop you. And this tells us, a good guideline for us, that whenever we find and we see ourselves in a situation, where Muslims are pressed, there is something that we have power to do. That's our responsibility and our deen will not stop us to do whatever is within our power. Not only that it will not stop us, although Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that it might cost him his life and is warning him, but when he sees the person ready for it, he didn't stop him from doing it. If you are willing, you are ready, you have your level of iman is of, the, of that level, that high, I want to stop you. I have no reason to stop you. And now we can understand, when we are put in those, those type of situations where there is something we can do for our deen, something that we can do for our Muslim brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, Of course, Abu Zar radiallahu anhu will be a good example for us. Who haven't been Muslim for years. He is Muslim only for some minutes, not even hours. But he could not stop himself from going and proclaiming Islam in the presence of all the leaders of Kufr. In the midst of the leader of Kufr, he would stand there and he is ready to say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, which means he is willing to commit the worst crime that was in the list of the crimes in the country, in that country at the time. And be eligible to the worst punishment could apply to any person in that land at that time. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in a hadith, a person who does not have any concern for his Muslim brothers and sisters for the Muslim ummah, that person is not bad of it, is not bad of the ummah. A person who does not have a concern for the ummah is not bad of the ummah. A person who separates himself from the rest of the ummah is not bad of the Ummah. And we find most of the time, when it comes to these type of situations, we just separate ourselves from the Ummah. We find ourselves just standing by our souls. That I'm worried about my things, my business, my work, my home, my family, my life. And thousands of people are being murdered every day. And I still will think they might be sinners. Who was sinner at that time when these people were oppressed in that way, in that manner? At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, ayazu billah, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do something wrong? Or those sahaba did something wrong? This is Sunnatullah. This is the way how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the Islam back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us very clearly in the Quran that there will be times that you will be oppressed. You will be pressed very bad. You will be shaken up. But the reason for that, 
ولما يعلم الله الذين جاهدوا منكم ويعلم الصابرين أم حسبتم أن تدخلوا الجنة Do you think that you would just go and enter Jannah by just saying that we are Muslims and doing few worships and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have not put your iman to test and he did not separate those who would be willing to sacrifice everything for Allah and he was, who are going to be practicing patience for the deen of Allah and those who will give up right away as soon as they will have a difficulty. He says, I'll have to separate these two groups in this life before they die. And then he tells us that sometime our feelings tell us, no, I'm one of those who would do everything. These are ayahs from Surah Al Imran. Go back and read these ayahs. You were looking for death before seeing it. Now you see the death, now you want to run away from it. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen that. Unfortunately, we are even afraid to do for our Muslim brothers and sisters what non-Muslims are doing for them. We are afraid to do for them what non-Muslims are not afraid to do for them. They will stand for it and we will be afraid to do it. <coughs> Whenever there are rallies, we'll try to hide ourselves and non-Muslims are holding posters there. Save the people of Palestine. You'll see the non-Muslims standing with it and we are hiding our souls. What? They might take my picture, tomorrow I'll be in trouble. We need to sign some papers to send it to the president. Not my signature on it. I will go to the masjid, I'll stand at the door, I'll have everyone sign it, but not me. I can't have my name and my address there. And every non-Muslim is going to sign that paper. We are afraid to do for our own brothers and sisters, for our own blood, what others are openly doing it. And they are not afraid of doing it. Abu Zar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu. He went by the Kaaba when all the leaders of Quraysh had, were there. And he announced, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. They beat him, up, beat him up so bad that he was almost dead when Abbas radiyallahu anhu was not a Muslim at the time. He went and told the people, told the leaders of Quraysh, what are you doing? He belongs to a clan that's Bani Ghifar. And that clan is on our way to Syria. And we always have to go to Syria for our business. If this clan will have a war against us, we will never be able to continue with our business. Just let him go. They let him go. People picked him up. Took him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By next evening, he was able to walk back. That's all he had. He got the strength to walk back. He got up. Ya Rasulullah. I feel so nice. I feel so good. All of these wounds are just like flowers on my body. Ya Rasulullah, please, once more only I would go and announce the shahada over there. He said, Abu Zar, you know what happened to you yesterday. Ya Rasulullah, this is why I want to do it again. This is where you find the level of your faith. I want to stop you. He went and did it again. And again, Abbas radiallahu anhu had to come and stop the people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he, looked, when he saw this level of iman, he said, Abu Zar, go back to your clan. And don't come back to me while I'm, I'm in Mecca. Come to me once I immigrate to Medina Munawar. And Abu Zar radiallahu anhu went back. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's immigration to Medina Munawar, he went back to Medina Munawar. During the Battle of Tabuk, and I have to make it very short, and as I said, inshallah, we'll try to keep one session per Sahabi, so I don't want to extend this to another session. During the Battle of Tabuk, there were many Munafiqeen who started going away, running away from the battlefield. Not from the battlefield, in fact, even from joining Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslim army to get to, up to, uh, to Tabuk. It was one of the most difficult journeys. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that munafiqeen one by one are just running away. So he did not pay any attention to who is leaving, did not care about that. He just ignored any person who would leave. On their way, Abu Zar radiallahu anhu, his camel got so weak that could not continue the journey anymore. And therefore he stayed behind. Finally, he decided my camel won't be able to continue the journey. He picked up all of his baggage on his back and followed the Muslim army. But of course, he was much behind the army. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived the book, the war did not take place. But as he arrived the book, he started looking for those who left. And as they started searching, who is not there? One of them is Abu Dhar. Now everyone is afraid. What happened to Abu Dhar? Why he's not here? And while they're talking about this topic, they see a person, a shadow of a person coming from far away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kun Abu Dhar, be Abu Dhar. As he came closer, Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, he is Abu Dhar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time made a statement about Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. A very important statement of his life. He says, Yamshi wahda. When he walks, he's all by himself, he's alone. He will die at a lonely place. No one will be around him. On the day of judgment, he will come all by himself, but he will be so powerful, his situation, his uh, position will be such that as if he is a whole ummah by himself. Abu Zar radiallahu anhu, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he moved to himself, that he would live exactly the way he used to live at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Would not change his lifestyle. And not only that, his opinion was, gathering the wealth is not allowed in Islam. That was his opinion. That having anything in your position more than what you need to eat and drink is not allowed in Islam. That was his opinion. And accordingly, he woke to himself that he would live the way he used to live at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was that? You find that he says, a glass of milk is enough for me for one day. In one day, all I need is one glass of milk. In one week, I need a handful of wheat. That's all that he used to have and acquire throughout his life. Because of that opinion, that is not allowed to get even more, he used to be very strict with those Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een who had a lot of wealth like Usman radiallahu anhu, like Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anhu, and most of many other Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een. And those Sahaba knew his opinion and knew his position in the sight of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he sometimes he would even in the masjid, in public, Usman radiallahu anhu as he became Khalifa, in public he would stand up and would say these type of things to Usman radiallahu anhu. But those Sahaba's heart was so pure and clean, they knew that he has a difference of opinion. They would take anything from Abu Zar radiallahu anhu. During the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and during the time of Bukhar, Abu Bakr Umar radiallahu anhu, it worked. But at the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, when many new converts came to Medina Munawwara in Makkah, and they started living over there, they didn't know how to respect these difference of opinions. Another big lesson for us, important lesson for us from the life of Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu that we don't have time to go into the detail, but at least we all can understand the point, understanding the difference of opinion and tolerating other people's opinions. What if someone would say why Abu Dhar did not tolerate other people's opinion? One of the two people will have to take it. And here, the rest of the all the Sahaba, Osman, in spite of being Amir al Mu'mineen, radiallahu anhu, still he would just take anything from Abu Dhar, radiallahu anhu. One day, Abu Dhar, radiallahu anhu, as he saw all of the wealth that Osman, radiallahu anhu, has, he was so upset that he even picked up the stick to beat him up. And Osman, radiallahu anhu, was just sitting there, did not say a single word. Look how they are respecting each other. Amir al Mu'mineen is being in that position and doesn't say a single word. Not even 
I have a difference of opinion with you. Not even to that extent. No. And normally their situation was that as Abu Dhar will say anything, they will say, correct, right, right, correct. Because there are a hadith that would indicate to what Uthman, what Abu Zar used to see. And they don't want to oppose those hadiths. They know that these hadiths don't mean what he's saying. But they don't want to oppose the hadiths. Respect for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, Abu Zar radiallahu anhu, because of his opinion, Usman radiallahu anhu had to tell him to go and live in a desert. He built a home for him. He said, you go and live over there, a place that was called Rabada, outside of Makkah Mukarramah. So he lived over there before his death. At the time of his death, his wife started crying that there is no one to wash you. There is no one to perform Salat al Janaz on you. He said, remember, once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I would die in a lonely place. But then he later on, he promised me that after you die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a whole group of people who would perform the Salat al Janaz on him. And as he was taking last breath, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was coming back from Hajj. And he happened to be at that place with the whole group that he came with for Hajj with from Syria, from, from Iraq, from Kufa and Basra. So Abu Zar radiallahu anhu's wife informed them that this is his Abu Zar radiallahu anhu is taking the last breath of his life. They waited over there, they washed his body, performed Salat al Janazah, and Abu Zar, they buried Abu Zar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq to follow the steps of these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa and learn our lessons of Iman and faith and taqwa from these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa ma'in. Akunu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-Muslimina wa al-Muslimat wa ahru da'wana alhamdulillahi wa